and welcome back to another episode of Tea, Tentacles, and Talk, cozy conversations about LGBTQ plus romance. I'm your host, Chloe Archer, uh, and I write MM sci-fi and paranormal rom-coms with plenty of heat, humor, and zany shenanigans. Uh, today, I'm super honored to have with me Amanda Mavison. Amanda is an MM romance author who dabbles in every subgenre, from fantasy to paranormal, occasional contemporary, and more. She lives in Minnesota, woo, <laughs> like yeah. me, and has published over 30 stories between novels and shorts, with her most popular title being fantasy novel The Prince and the Ice King. She also has an exciting new release that we'll be talking about today. Um, so welcome to the show, Amanda. So glad you could join me. This is tea and talk. So I always encourage my guests to bring a beverage with them if they have one. What have you got with you today? I was going to grab tea, which would have seemed fitting, but I'm a <laughs> coffee girl. Couldn't help myself. I still grabbed my morning coffee. And I now, do have my favorite. It's funny. It's actually like the Target brand coffee, mm. but they have a cinnamon and vanilla one that's just my favorite. So I grabbed one of my favorite. My little oh. mug from Ghost Alley in uh, oh, Seattle so that I grabbed last yeah. year. Oh, cute. And, well, and I actually got this one because it fits with one of my novels, Gardening with a Ghost. So it seemed like a fitting one to, <laughs> to have. Well, and also I think it's appropriately festive. It is September now. And true, so we it's true. into the like month, uh, the, the season of Halloween. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think many That's of us true. who love the holiday, you know, try to kind of gear up to that for a while. <laughs> uh, well, I'm super excited to talk with you. Um, many times we have uh, folks on the show um, who are involved in sort of MM romance, although eventually I'm going to kind of branch out and uh, into other areas of LGBTQ romance. But um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about sort of what drew you to MM romance in the first place. Well, I'm I'm a fan fiction person, which I think a lot a lot can say that ended up kind of getting into this genre. Um, so I mean, I've been writing since I was a young, young, young teen. I was actually part of uh, fanfiction.net in like within its first oh, year or two yeah. of existence. Because um, I always say that the way I can really date myself is if people remember from those early days, yep. you could have mul multiple people could have the same name. So my mm -hmm. writing name was always Crimson and there was like a million Crimsons. And eventually they realized, oh, that's really hard to be able to find people's work if people have the same names. Yeah. So they did an auto thing where it just added numbers after the people based on when they became a member. I mm -hmm. got auto assigned Crimson One. Oh, wow. Meaning, meaning I was the second technically because the first didn't have a numeral after their name. So, I mean, for such an easy kind of name that tells you how early in the process <laughs> I was a member of FF.net. Um, and I, I probably dabbled maybe a little bit in just more generic fantasy, my favorite kind of um, fandoms and stuff, sure. But I got into the MM side of things really early on. I just always um, relate more to male characters and more relation uh, male relationships are more interesting to me. And I mean that whether it's I love father, son, I love brothers, I love any kind of friendships, I, I love it all. And then that eventually just kind of went naturally into the romance side of it. And I, I never really looked back. Like I, I've mm -hmm. always just really dove headfirst into that. Nice. Yeah. I mean, and I think, you know, MM is such a wonderfully welcoming and supportive community on the whole, which is great. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about there's there's another podcast where um, the host always asks this question. and I really love this question, which is, why do you write? Um, I mean, I think every writer kind of has different sort of reasons. You mentioned that you've been writing sort of since uh, you were a teenager. Um, what is it that uh, sort of makes you feel like I've got to do this. I've got to write and I've got to share stories with the world. I think even before teenage years was definitely when I was really aware of wanting to write and craft things, especially on the fan fiction side, because it was easier to dive into those worlds because they yeah. already have some of the, the hard part done for you. Right. Mm -hmm. But even before then, I was that kid who could easily entertain myself, but by imagination wise, you know, I'm, con I was constantly building worlds and just 
being out at trying to think up these other like fantasy worlds and things constantly. And eventually it just got to that point where it was bubbling up so much. It had to get out of me and writing was the natural way that that came about. I also um, was really involved in acting, which granted that's not necessarily always, um, you know, saying your own words, but it's similar in, you know, you're portraying something that's not you. You're trying to get across Mm -hmm. a story. You're trying to evoke an emotional response. Um, And really it was hard for me to decide between the two. Um, It was late high school. I was trying to debate. I'm like, do I want to pursue acting or do I want to pursue writing? Because I loved them equally. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was actually because of um, a piece of writing of mine that really like heavy heart hit a reader who um, contacted me and and talked to me about it. And it was not that I haven't had great emotional responses through acting as well, but there was Mm -hmm. something about the writing aspect of it and feeling like I could affect someone's life in such a profound way that, you know, even though that was 25 years ago, I still feel the same way. And anytime I can get a review or a response out of somebody that feels like that, it's like, yeah, this is why I'm doing this. Um, so it's for me, I love to, I love to write, but it's that idea that you could actually change someone's perspective. And I just, I have to do it. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, readers don't always realize like how impactful a review or even just a kind note or message or email that they send us can be like, for me, I mean, it's like, a triple shot of espresso or something like I'm like oh my gosh like I've got to keep writing I'm super excited to want to keep giving stories to folks who really enjoy that so you know if you're watching and you you've thought about like you know I read something by an author and I really loved it uh but I'm too I I don't want to bother them it's not a bother uh never bother we love to hear from you uh because sometimes writing can be a little isolating and you're sort of like in this little void of your own. And so it's wonderful to get that kind of feedback from people who like our stuff. Um, (laughs) So tell me a little bit about, because I'm always interested, since I'm a comparatively new writer, I just had my one year uh, publishing anniversary. Congrats again. It's really exciting. Um, But I'm still learning. And so I always love to talk to other authors a little bit about like their process. What, What would you say is your writing process? And is it pretty set? Or do you find it changes with each book and kind of in what ways? Now that I've been doing this for so long, because I've been publishing for over a decade now, mm. um, and I, I feel like I have a system. I didn't know. Oh, nice. uh, okay. I'm definitely um, that cross between a planter and a, what is it again? I always get it wrong. Planter and. Per- Pantser and plotter. Panzer and plotter. I can never remember how to say it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm that mix, right, of the, of yeah. the two. Um, but really for me, what I, I kind of do now, and, and, and this tends to stay the same, is I'll, I'll have an idea that sparks, and that can come from many things. Um, sometimes it's a character or it's a particular plot or somebody says, hey, would you like to be part of this collaboration? And it's a really loose concept, but it just sends me on this tangent of some idea. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I have that initial concept and it's starting to build, I always have a notes document. And so I'm just constantly writing things down. And at first I let it be really free flowing where mm-hmm. it's like, OK, I'll, I, I like to do bios. So it's like um, particularly for like how the characters look like here's their age, here's their eye color, here's their yeah. skin color, here's their, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, little tidbits or things that are important about them um, Mm. and the side characters and stuff. And then I'll just make notes about things that I want to happen. I'll Mm. usually then start the first, like the prologue or the first chapter to let things flow and and naturally feel where they're supposed to go. And I kind of know where I want to end, but I'm not quite sure about the middle. And Mm. it's after I let the muse bring me through those first few chapters, that's when I'll go back to my notes and I more systematically start organizing things chapter by chapter. Because mm-hmm. now I've gotten a feel for what these characters want. All right, well, now I think this is going to be the progression. These are going to be the plot points. These are going to be the beats, right? I... And that's not to say that that doesn't change as I go, because I might get uh-huh. halfway through and they've decided to go a totally different direction. <laughs> uh, but that's kind of how I, I work. It's like, it's notes. I start the first few chapters. I refine the notes. The characters go off the rails. I refine the notes again. Um, (laughs) And then actually my favorite part is when I get to go back and do the editing because one, I've forgotten half of what I've written. So it's a treat. It's like, oh, I forgot about that scene. Oh, that was a nice part. Um, And then I'm taking notes during the editing process of, oh, crap, I forgot about that. Oh, I led that at the beginning. I got to make sure I tie that in later. Um, So there's lots of back and forth between the two documents. Um, But I find it efficient for me and how my brain works now. Um, And it tends to be my same process for pretty much every book. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I I haven't 
met a uh, a lot of writers yet who are exclusively one or the other like complete yeah. plotter or com- complete pants or uh, there's always like a little bit there's somewhere on the spectrum they may lean more heavily one direction but there's always like a little bit yeah I often tend to start where I like know the beginning I know the end Mm-hmm. I may know some things that are going to happen at different points, but I don't know when or how they're going to get there. And so, you know, I go on the journey with <laughs> the character characters. Um, so uh, many times in the writing process, uh, authors have to actually conduct research because you know newsflash we don't know everything just off the top of our heads that we write about um so what is the weirdest thing you've ever done in the name of research for your writing uh I, i'd say the weirdest and this was a long time ago and i actually i don't have a book example for this because this is oh, a story okay. this is a story that if you have one of those stories that like you had the idea when you were a little kid and you've kind of tried to create the story forever, but it just doesn't come out of you. I mean, I know a few other authors who maybe have that white whale story. This yeah. is my white whale story. basically. Oh, okay. And one day, one day I will actually write, <laughs> like I have a screenplay version of it written, but when I try to turn it into prose, I, I just can't seem to do it. So there's still something I'm not finding about the story, but mm-hmm. it's sci-fi. Um, and it involves sort of like a genetic research. And I literally chose to take one of my science courses in college about <gasps> genetics specifically so I could make oh, sure you- that these ideas for this story were reasonable. <laughs> I mean, yes, it's sci-fi and it's set in the future and things like that. Right. But I, I actually, you know, took the class specifically just to prove wow. whether or not it was possible. And I talked to my professor. I remember at one point she was great. A professor. Uh, no, I'm going to get the wrong name. I, I won't say it because I'm going to get the wrong name. I'm okay. now, but, um, but basically I talked to her about it and I said, okay, here's my concept. Even though we don't have the technology technically yet, uh. does this seem reasonable? And she absolutely assuaged my fears about it. And then um, I named like a side character after her in the story Aww. and things like that. And so Funny. that's definitely the weirdest to actually take a college course purely to prove <laughs> a, a, a <laughs> hypothesis correct about right. a story idea. Oh my God. Um, I would definitely say that's That's true. a level of commitment. Yeah. <laughs> so I better write this story and put it out to the world at some point other than right. the screenplay that I've had for 20 years. Um, even longer, really, because th- it was a story that I started writing probably when I was, I don't know, 12. Um, mm. but, and it eventually evolved into MM and wasn't in the beginning. So we'll, we'll see. I hope one day. Um, I know sci-fi isn't always one of the biggest sellers. And when I say that to readers, they'll be like, what? That's ridiculous. But it does still prove to be true when you're looking at numbers. Um, yeah. But I I write what I love. So if I have the muse want to do it, I'm not going to care about what things are the popular trend at the time. Right. Yeah, me too. You know, my first uh, series uh, was sci-fi. Um, it's still ongoing. And, you know, and I, I didn't like follow probably like the smartest business approach to that in the sense that it, you know, the first four books follow the same main couple. So it's a continuing, you've got to read them in order. It's not like uh, standalones, interconnected standalones and stuff like that, which tend to sell better too. And like, <laughs> but um, you gotta just not listen to that if you're doing it because exactly, you love it in yeah, my you opinion have to, yeah. yeah you do and and honestly it um like the first book and just the series in general like that got me started because I'd been writing for a very long time myself um probably the I started writing in around fourth grade when I started reading epic fantasy novels like all my peers were reading like you know babysitter's club and I have like these big <laughs> like Terry Brooks sort of Shannara like you know tomes with me and stuff and I got really into epic fantasy and I was just like you know I I was a creative kid and so like my mind just was immediately it opened up to this whole new world of like possibilities (laughs) and you know started writing then but um you know I think um uh I may be a bit a little bit older than you, but you know, when I was in my early 20s and I was like thinking about trying to become a writer, um, the only options were traditional publishing. Uh oh, and, yeah. and you know, um, and I I wrote a novel, uh, a bad <laughs> urban fantasy novel. This was at the height of like when like kick-ass heroines and urban fantasy started coming out, like 2000 and to something like that. Sure, uh, sure. And uh, 
And it was a good concept, but not great execution. But like, you know, and I queried a whole bunch of agents and I just didn't get anywhere. And I just sort of thought, oh man, you know, this must be just like impossible to, to achieve. So, you know, fast forward and, you know, the pandemic hit and just a whole lot of, you know, realizations. And I'm like, you know what, I just need to write something. <laughs> and it was kind of like, well, you know what, what do I want to read? actually Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that somebody else isn't writing um and that's kind of what got me started um and so i i certainly encourage any of uh my viewers who are aspiring authors or you would love to write something someday always start with the book you really want to read because Mm -hmm. you've got a higher likelihood of finishing it right and that book is likely to also have resonance with other people because your passion and enthusiasm go into it so I think that that's even if it's not to market even if it's not like what's super popular right now you've got to write the book of your heart that like really makes you happy and yeah so (laughs) that's all agreed Agreed (laughs) um so uh let's talk about your upcoming release uh the last courtesan of Olympus so let me just say I've seen this cover all over social media for like a while now. And I'm not joking. Every time I have to stop (laughs) and look at it some more because it's just so fantastic. Just really beautiful, stunning, erotically sensual. Like, I mean, it's got like all of these components. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, who did your cover and like what the design process was like for this? Absolutely. So the artist for this is Thander Lynn. Um, and it, fans of mine know that Thander also did uh, my Lovesick covers. So that's a duology, Lovesick Gods and Lovesick Titans. Previously were always my favorite covers from people because again, the artwork is just so gorgeous. Yeah. You might also recognize the art style because Thander did, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to swap these two around wrong, but it's the Lust and Lore or Lore and Lust series. It's a okay. vampire one. P- people would recognize it if they're familiar mm-hmm. with it. It's like a beautiful face with like flowers around it. And it's, it's a at least two book series. I know Thander did two, two different covers within that series at the very least. Um, so MM Romance is definitely something Thander has dabbled in for covers previously. Yeah. And one of the most amazing people to work with. Like, I just had so much fun. Like, it was great with Lovesick, too. But with um, Cortison, I had this. This was what I wanted. This was the exact image I had in my head. I'm mm-hmm. like, I know I want it to be Icos, the main character, just sort of sprawled and gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And I want a representation of all of the gods that he encounters around him. Mm-hmm. And if anybody out there listening is an artist, you know that hands are one of the most difficult things for anybody to draw. I mean, try just drawing a hand it's hard anyway but even for experienced artists hands yeah. are hard and I said I'm gonna make you draw nine <laughs> you know well plus <laughs> I, hands. Um, I was just and I, be distinctive. <laughs> and they all have to be a little bit different and there's got to yeah. be like they're different size and slightly different skin tones and like yeah it, it was um that was a lot to ask for so it was a long process um of like week after week after week of you know starting with the initial um sketch design which I have which also looks gorgeous and then just little by little the rendering and adding in the hands and adding in the different color tints and stuff and this was actually the most uh proof copies of a paperback that I've ever ordered I think I I ended up ordering five because I wanted it to print perfectly and and I this is Amazon exclusive and when you're doing that it's like sometimes it can print a little dark so mm-hmm. i and i wanted to make sure that that saturation of the color was as perfect as possible so i kept going back to thander and being like can you just tweak it a little bit this it needs to be a little less pink it needs to be a little like only for the paperback cover the rest for all my promo images is, is beautiful and perfect and my lovely big banner that i bring to conventions yeah. now and um but but it was just it's very casual and easy to work with thander at the back and forth um i it was just everything I could have possibly wanted, like um, from the initial sketch actually to the first rendering of the face, um, Mm -hmm. he ended up looking a little too young to me. And I went back and he said, oh, can you can you kind of tweak it? I want it to look even closer to your original sketch because I really liked the way his face shape was. Mm. Boom, next day. Like just amazing turnaround for being able to understand what you want. Um, And that's like the best thing is finding artists that just are easy to work with and can kind of get what you mean when you're trying to explain what you want. Right. And so it was just fantastic. 
I, I couldn't, I wouldn't change a single thing. It's exactly what I wanted. Um, in this case too, I had Thander do the full paperback wrap. So, um, which of course okay. I sold out. So I don't have the physical <laughs> paperbacks. I had some early ones um, for our Minnesota Renaissance Festival over Labor Day weekend. And I sold out of all of them and I don't have my next shipment yet. But um, so Thander also did the back and the spine and all of the mm -hmm, topography that you mm -hmm. see. And I just, I mean, it's just perfect and so wonderful. And I'm sure I will go back to Thander again. Um, I already had a few authors like poke me and say, who is it? Can I have their contact information? Because they're right. so great. And fair warning, um, Thander too, um, often is at least six months backed up with yeah. a queue, you know, of course. Right. Oh, yeah. It's so amazing. Um, but yeah, it was great. I couldn't have asked for something being the vision in my head more perfectly. It is exactly mm. what I wanted. That's great. Like, so do you feel like in most of your covers, you have a visual in your mind for what you want? It, it depends. Um, like I recently did uh, little paperbacks uh, for my short stories too, because a, um, a reader had requested it. Oh, you ever going to have signed copies of this? I'm like, it's a short. Let me check on the minimum page number and see if I can actually turn this into a little paperback. Um, so with, and with my shorts, since originally I was assuming I would just do ebook only with them, I designed the covers myself. And it was more so just finding imagery and things that evoked what I wanted. I didn't necessarily have a clear vision. Mm -hmm. Um, but for my novels, I almost always do. Um, obviously, I do a lot of, I've recently done a lot of collaborations. And when you're doing multi-author collaborations, there's usually like a set thing yeah. going on. You choose a background, you choose your model, you choose maybe your color scheme to go with how the font and everything's going to work with your title. Right. But you don't choose um, exactly how everything's going to look, right? Mm -hmm. which is fine you know as long as you get the one that you like like I've always absolutely loved how my collaboration covers have turned out so as long as I'm happy I don't care yeah um but for my ones where I have a little bit more control like uh I uh, mentioned the the prince and the ice king is probably my most popular that one originally had um the two main characters on the cover mm -hmm. um and the publisher decided you know let's actually um go for something a little bit more mainstream marketplace because we think we can sell this a bit more broader mm. um so i changed it to a cover that's a little bit more uh, it doesn't have the guy on the cover kind of thing mm -hmm. um and in that case when we were trying to figure out what direction we wanted to go i designed like a mock-up how about we do something like this it has the gemstone um because uh -huh. each of the books in the series focus on a gemstone named kingdom yeah. it has some nice like simple imagery um that just sort of evokes what you want and definitely tells you this is a fantasy novel um, and I love the way those covers turned out. You know, the their the artist took that and just polished my initial concept. So it mm. kind of goes back and forth. Sometimes I'm I'm pretty loose and sometimes I have a very clear vision of what I want. Mm. Um, if I ever am gonna hire an illustrator, and I do love the illustrated covers, even though of course they do tend to be more expensive, as they should be, because the work deserves it. Um, then I tend to have a very clear, like yeah. if I'm if I'm doing an illustration, I know exactly what I want. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I just I find this uh, part of the process also really fascinating. Um, I uh, always wished I was artistically inclined. Uh, sadly, I am not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I rarely have an idea for like, what what should be on the cover. Sometimes I'm like, well, you know, I can look at what what's in the market and you pro probably need like a, a man on there <laughs> like, um, uh, but I learned pretty quickly that I I am not allowed to pick most of the models because <laughs> I apparently have no idea what readers find attractive <laughs> no this is kind of cute they're like no no Oh, so that's now funny. I just usually leave it to my cover artist to like, okay, you 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 pick. Um, uh, the exception is an upcoming uh, secret Christmas project uh, that we're actually both part of um, that I did pick the model for that one for very, very specific reason. And so I'll be letting readers know about that eventually. But, um, <laughs> but usually I don't pick the model because I don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> But um, so I'm I'm super intrigued about this new release, the Last Courtesan of Olympus. Um, tell us a little bit more about um the story and how did you sort of choose the the topic for this book? How would we classify this? Is this historical fantasy or is it erotica? Like, believe me, um, that was one of the hardest things for me to decide because um, mm. real upfront, I, I've been 
trying to push and make readers understand I cannot classify this as traditional romance. So I specifically, like I was actually polling and asking him like, no, nope, everyone agreed. Nope. I cannot put it in romance because it's not, this is ah. not traditional. It's not going to have that normal, like what you would expect about romantic ending. That's not really what the story is. I did absolutely put it in the gay erotic category, mm. but um, any readers who, who've read it early would tell you this is so much more than just erotica. Every chapter absolutely has some really like deep, the most spicy scenes I've, <laughs> I've, I've ever written in my life. Nice. Um, but it delves deeper into like, what is love? What are the different types of love? Um, helping each of the gods actually learn something about themselves. And Icos is the main character having this character journey as well. So I, which surprised me. Um, Cause so I have a huge love of Greek mythology. That's mm. one thing that's always been in the back burner for me. Like ever since I was young, 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 um, you know, fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you know, yeah. whenever we were first going over that module, right. Um, absolutely adored it. So I, I have a very, um, big knowledge base just naturally of Greek mythology mm -hmm. and then uh, I, I blame this one friend of mine uh, Daniel Mitchell uh, he's also an author he has some fantastic Dungeons and Dragons inspired uh, fantasy oh. books um, mm -hmm. that I always recommend because I love them to death um, but he uh, we play D&D &D together online nice and he was giving me a hard time because I'd never played a Zelda game before like never it just wasn't a si I didn't have the systems it was on I'd never played yeah, it yeah yeah uh, and this is after this was last year um and finally i'm like all right i'll play breath of the wild and of course it's fantastic it's wonderful anyone who's a gamer knows it is a fantastic game <laughs> um and i was so in that mode then of playing i started looking up i'm like i want something that kind of has this feel is there anything else that has similar gameplay mm -hmm. style mm -hmm. um and there was um and the number one that people were recommending was um uh, I, I get this one flipped around too. I always get the order of the words flipped around, but it's like mm -hmm. Phoenix Immortal Rising or Immortal Phoenix Rising. And it's okay. similar gameplay style, but it's um, all based in Greek mythology. You would probably love it because it has a great sense of humor. Oh, yay. Um, which I'd say, uh, you know, court is, my, my book is much more, um, takes a more serious approach, though it has some lightness to it because Icos is quite funny. But that is what actually kicked off the inspiration for me to do this. And there's very few things you'll see that are similar from this, you know, cute video game uh, to what I wrote, um, other than some Easter eggs of like, ways the gods look like I took like, mm -hmm. I like, Oh, I really like Aries looking like that. I'm going to kind of design my Aries to look kind of like that. Um, and little things like that. There's nothing erotic in the actual, well, there's some funny, dirty jokes in the video game, but that's about it. <laughs> um, but that really kicked off the inspiration for me to write it. I'm like, oh, I would love to actually write something that um, goes into each of these gods. Um, and I knew I wanted it to be heavy erotica, mm -hmm. but I had no idea how much it would end up having this really compelling plot until I started yeah. writing it. And I'm like, oh, this is more than just a romp through Olympus. Like this is hey. actually like touching and um, like says something about the different variations of love. Mm -hmm. um, and there's still a few scenes in it when I reread them that give me chills and um and that's always something I, I strive for in my own writing is like yeah, I want something yeah. I can read over and over again that I love just as much every time um mm -hmm. so this was a huge passion project brought from old love of uh Greek mythology old love of video games because I'm a huge geek and just yeah. the inspiration struck and it went in amazing places well, you know, that that's really fascinating that you bring up the video game thing, because like when I looked at the cover and I read the blurb and like immediately in my mind, I started thinking like Japanese dating sim game, which I've like <laughs> never actually I know them very well because I'm also an anime geek, but yeah, I've yeah, never yeah. actually like fully played through a dating sim. Oh, really? OK. Like I know. But okay. but of course, I've seen enough anime that kind of cover that trope. And, yeah. and of course, I, I know because um, a lot of people have said, oh, is this reverse harem? And for anyone not familiar with it, you know, usually the harem idea is you have the female character and then, or, well, well either, no, 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 that is the reverse. The regular harem was you have the male character and there's all these female characters and it's right. like, ooh, will he end up with any? And mm -hmm. then the reverse harem normally was then you have the female character with all the guys. It's still reverse right. harem if it's MM is the idea that there's all these guys. Mm -hmm. um, and I say no in the fact that they don't all share him together. Like, mm -hmm. you're not going to see one huge scene with all of the gods together with Icos. They each have their, like, private chapter with him. Right. But they do share him in the fact that he gets passed from one to the next. Mm -hmm. Um, And without spoiling things, it's, you know, can he choose between them? Mm -hmm. What will he decide? Because mm -hmm. um, the concept around it is that uh, Zeus snatches him up when he's supposed to be given to, like, a high priest of Aphrodite to serve. 
And it is supposed to be a, a sexual type of, of servitude as a courtesan, which he's all for. Like this isn't, he chose this life and absolutely yeah. loves it. Um, and he's expecting still a more mortal existence and then gets kidnapped by Zeus, as many stories go. And he's yeah. supposed to get passed around and then decide to choose one of these gods to be his ah. master instead. Um, mm -hmm. And it's whether or not he can. And of course, the biggest question on his mind is, if I choose one, will all the others try to kill, torture, turn me into a right. creature? Like, what horrible fate awaits me if I right. piss off any of these gods? Gods are capricious. <laughs> so how, how can he possibly survive this in a way that whatever decisions yeah. he makes and how he navigates through them all, mm -hmm. will they still consider him sacred too and not want to actually cause him any harm so there's there's that level of fear too because the gods are you know if you know any of these myths some of them are quite yeah. scary um and i had a lot of fun with some unique takes on some of them some of them are the familiar some of them i decided to go a slightly different direction mm -hmm. um with how i interpreted um the myths um and of course probably my favorite thing is hearing from arc readers which god was your favorite and literally mm -hmm. all of them get said at some point by different readers <laughs> makes me happy. I'm like, oh, good. It's not like one absolutely stood out. Mm -hmm. but for different people, ones are standing out. And I mm -hmm. love that. That's what I was hoping for. Well, that begs the question, who was your favorite character to write and why? I, I, I do have to admit, I did have a favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite is Apollo. Ooh. I love them all. Don't get me God. wrong. Like I have. I have some great um, love for Hephaestus. Hephaestus is actually first. Um, and I, I that was done very purposely to make sure Hephaestus was the first one because Hephaestus is the one that you don't, you don't tend to think when you think of the other sexy gods because he's considered, he's the lame god, right? He's yeah. the one that's supposed to be scarred and disfigured and all these things. And so it was very important for him to be first. Um, mm. And of course I love Poseidon because tentacle. I was going to say. <laughs> I know, I do, I do. But it was Apollo. Mm. And partially it's because with Apollo's the one that surprised me where I decided to take him. Mm. Um, it, it, I feel like the story kind of has to get, each God has to have something get a little bigger about them. Not necessarily like individual powers, but like either it's location, something about them. The story needs to keep getting bigger and bigger. So it feels like it's heading towards something. Right. And right. Apollo was really a moment for me that started opening it up to the possibilities and that's the chapter where I have that this particular moment that always gives me chills when I reread it. Um, and I just ended up loving that one the most. Um, and some people have said that as well. But then, yeah, again, with readers, every chapter has a, a favorite fan so far. But mm -hmm. Apollo, I had a lot of fun with. Um, and actually, I haven't mentioned yet, too, uh, with this book, I did put all of the possible content warnings at the very front. And then okay. before each chapter, there was also the specific content warnings for that encounter with that God. Um, and some, some readers have said, you know, they don't need the content warnings, but they use it as a way of what to look forward to <laughs> with each <laughs> chapter. Like, Ooh, uh, we're going to do that this time, right? <laughs> Which I love. Um, and I don't usually put content warnings unless I think there's going to be something that's really going to hit someone sure. in a strange way. But this is so different than anything I've ever done. It's, it's yeah. so erotic a focus. I, I really felt the need. Um, mm -hmm. So with Apollos, there's, you know, heat play, of course. I mean, mm -hmm. it's the sun god. That's got to be a thing. Um, yes. And yeah, some of it's like, oh, I don't want to give it away. Um, but yeah. it's also, you know, things to look forward to. And, and right. those little warnings right. tell you. Just a little amuse-bouche. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's like, well, ooh, it's we're going to do that this yeah. chapter. Let's keep going. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. So um, that makes me uh, want to ask. So do you envision this as completely staying a standalone? Uh, or, you know, are the, is there a secondary character or characters you'd like to explore more in their own books and why? So... Overall, I'm considering it a standalone story. Um, there is um, a side character, which is um, Icos' best friend. Um, since I'm dealing with all the gods, I didn't want to dive right in, but I still wanted every chapter to have a sexual encounter of some sort. So even the prologue had to have one before we get to the gods. So you start yeah. right off with Icos and his friend Dax, who is also an acolyte of Aphrodite, who will be ascending as a courtesan. Um, they're basically, you know, releasing some tension before their ascension. Sure. Uh, and I loved, I ended up loving Dax way more than I expected. And um, his character does come back at the end. Mm. Um, and I had actually dabbled in the idea of uh, right now, if you sign up for my newsletter, you can read the prologue of Last Courtesan for free. 
Mm. And I was going to swap it once the book came out. And I thought, oh, maybe I'll do this new story, like a little short with Dax as a potential teaser for something. But if I do that, it would kind of be a spoiler for the book, Mm -hmm. what I would do with him. So I'm like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. So I might hold off. But I might um, at some point like do a little companion short about what happens to Dax um, nice. which if you, if you have read the book already, you kind of know where that would be going, but it would be a spoiler to say. Um, yeah. So I'd love to do Dax's story as a short. Mm-hmm. Secondary to that, um, and this would be completely separate, just more um, conceptually tied together. I might do like a companion piece that is a totally new cast of characters with the Norse gods next year. Um, I thought that might be a fun departure. Oh, yeah. Because that that's my next, like, Greek gods are my favorite. Norse gods is my next favorite. Um, and I think I could have a lot of fun with doing a very different cultural deep dive because it's, oh, it is sure. so different. Right. Um, the hard part would be like, okay, what do I, like, I I love the message that um, Last Courtesan has. Mm. I'm not sure yet what I would want to do. I'd have to wait and see um, what are these characters. Because it definitely wouldn't be, um, like, it'd be a human MC again, but it definitely wouldn't be a courtesan type. It wouldn't be someone who's right. worshiping the gods right. in that same way. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd probably need a different name. It'd have to be last something of Valhalla, right? Like, it would have to be, wouldn't be courtesan. Right. So I'll have to think of how I want to play this Viking up. or... <laughs> something, right? Like, yeah, would, yeah. would I want to set it maybe right as, you know, Christianity and other religions are sort of starting to push out mm-hmm. that? And like, how do I want to play it? I, I don't know. Um, but I'm definitely um, starting to play around with ideas of maybe doing that. So um, there will probably be more, but it wouldn't be something where it would take away from this being a standalone. Okay. Okay. Uh, and so this comes out Tuesday, September 12th. Uh, so by the time this episode airs, it will be out. So make sure to run out and get your hot little hands on this super sexy looking book. I'm really excited to get my copy. <laughs> um, well, I want to shift gears a little bit and um, talk a little bit more about you. Um, so obviously, writers, we have specific things we like to write about. Um, but what do you like to read when you have limited free time, I'm sure, uh, to do that? What, what kinds of things do you gravitate? Is it the same kind of stuff that you write? Or are there like categories or genres that you enjoy but personally don't write? Uh, I definitely gravitate the most towards basically my same genre. Hmm. Um, I do is because I have limited time, I do a lot of author swaps. So um, since I don't have a lot of time, it's like, hey, I'll read yours. You read mine. We kind of beta read each other's. And then you get some extra author feedback Mm -hmm. and get to read a great new story at the same time. You know, I like that trade off. Uh, One thing that was a lot of fun, particularly last year when I was a part of the uh, Monsters and Mayhem collaboration, when I did my Dracula retelling is I actually swapped with there was like four like I always read I read K.L. Hires which is in Darkness and Dank that's the creature from the Black Lagoon retelling yeah. um, and then I also swapped with um, Laura Lascarso I hope I didn't pronounce that one and Helly Heat um, and three the three of us actually at the same time I don't think K.L. was in there at the same time but the three of us at the same time were just reading each other's um, and oh my god the valuable feedback but also just how much I loved both of theirs um, which is a Beautiful Adam is Laura's, which is the um, Portrait of Dorian Gray, one of the absolute best books I've read in so long. And what made that one stand out for me is it's set contemporary. Like a lot of us had um, horror retellings that yeah. are kind of classic. You know, you had a Frankenstein, you have Dracula, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but Beautiful Adam was very contemporary set, very um, grounded in reality mm-hmm. um, with just the most viciously awful characters ever, you know, in like in a great way. Right. <laughs> um, and I just loved it. Like I, I ate it up. I loved every second. And then in contrast, especially reading at the same time, Helly's as the um, Jekyll and Hyde retelling was mm-hmm. such um, was actually similar to how I was dealing with um, Dracula because we were both immersed in that late 18th century kind of oh. world of London. And mm-hmm. so um and yeah, I, which I surprised myself with how much I actually liked the historical fiction writing aspect of it, like the research into what is London like here. And like there were little tidbits that we'd get from each other's works, like, oh, I want to mention something like that in mine. Like, you know, so I mean, I love I love the community aspect. That's my favorite way to to read is when it's another author who I'm, I'm friends with and I love their work. And yeah. like, it's just it's just so much fun for me um, because then we give each other ideas. Uh, so I love that. Um, and then previously, actually, when I was first starting um, 
writing, I was actually part of this little indie publisher that was not LGBTQ focused at all. It was all of the above. Um, and I helped uh, edit and publish over 60 books from various authors and wow. so different genres. Like because of that, because of being an editor, I got to read things I never probably would have picked up, you know, cute mm -hmm. little mysteries here and um, different kind of fantasies and horror and just so much stuff that I never would have. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, if uh, like, I kind of missed that. I wish I had a little bit more time again to go back <laughs> and, and read that. Um, but otherwise, I'd say absolutely, I tend to stick to the genre. I mentioned when I talk about the genres I write in, contemporary is my, my the one I write in the least. So yeah. it is the one I tend to read the least because I like getting lost in fantasy and paranormal sure, worlds more so. Yeah. But I do still like it and it does still happen if, if the ideas strike. So it, it just depends. But I, I will admit, I tend to read my friends more than I read like... <laughs> I, more than I read authors that I don't know personally, because if I have yeah. limited time, I like kind of cheerleading my friends. I, I totally understand. Uh, I think it's the one thing that I wasn't expecting when I started writing was that my reading time was going to diminish so much. Mm -hmm. um, partly just, uh, and I think it it, it definitely uh, is somewhat affected by the fact too that I still have a full time day job, um, and so you know it, it becomes one of those things where when you're juggling kind of two jobs, essentially your free time is quite limited. And so it's like almost every time I've got free time, I'm I'm using it to write or I'm involved in the, the podcast stuff here yes. uh, with other authors. Um, so yeah, I think that that was that was kind of unexpected. So I'm I'm I've noticed I become a lot more selective just because I I don't have uh, quite as much time. Um, are so are you uh, actually full time now? I know you've been writing for ten years, but are you full time? And and sort of what is that like? I am a full-time writer. Um, it's been a, like two and a half years now, a little, little over two years that I've been writing full-time, um, which was the best thing in the world. Like I was, I, I worked in marketing and I was just mm. so done. Like I love my coworkers and it, it was a great company to work yeah. with. But I was done. I was ready to leave and just be able to write full-time. And my husband and I actually had worked out like our five-year plan of okay, what's, how's he going to switch his career to help supplement, you know, while I'm still kicking things off the ground to make sure that we're, you know, making enough money. Like we had a whole plan in place for him to have the career he wanted and for me to have the career I wanted. Okay. And we made it work. And it was the best thing ever when I was finally able to just leave that job and do this full time. One thing I will tell you is that does not mean I have more time to read or write <laughs> um, because all that time that was the day job time yeah. now is this day job time in the sense of now I'm doing all the clerical stuff I didn't have time to do. Now I have a much better, you know, profit loss statement where I'm keeping track of things I'm spending, right? Like now I'm able to do all that other stuff that I barely yeah. had time to squeak through. And right. that takes up all that extra time. Because when I had the day job, I made the time to write. Mm -hmm. Now I technically have the time, but you need to put it on focusing on your promotions and yeah. uh, networking. And like, there's just so many little things that kind of creep in and take your time anyway, that it did not give me more oh, reading or writing time at all. So don't think that that'll happen. Um, obviously you can set your schedule in certain ways. Uh, sometimes I try to tell myself, all right, today I've just got to close that Facebook window yeah. and I've got to not even allow myself to get distracted because I have to finish these edits yeah. or this chapter or whatever. But mm -hmm. it, it just takes on a different beast of stuff. It's good stuff. Because how dramatically I, I increased my overall revenue just because I could put in the time to reach more people. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it's sad but true that quitting the day job finally gives, you know, helps you earn the money you need to quit. You know, <laughs> it's unfortunately, uh -huh. right? <laughs> but it, it it's one of those things we 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 planned for. We were smart about it. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it's been great. Um, I absolutely love it. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think many, many writers, I think, aspire to getting there. Um, I would certainly love to someday. Uh, I am single, however, so I, I am, you know, uh, I need to keep my dogs in the lifestyle to which they become accustomed. accustomed at like 
<laughs> so yeah, so so we'll see. Um, but uh, hopefully one day. But um, but speaking of of animals, I know many authors. We have our our fur family members who often are kind of quiet support for us in the writing process, help us manage our stress. Um, what, uh, if any pets do you have and what can you tell us about them? Well, if you notice that there is a cat tree behind me, I was actually hoping <laughs> that she'd be sleeping there, but she's not. She of course not. <laughs> of course she's not today where I can easily grab her. Uh, but I have a cat. Um, she nice. is Helga von Puffinstuff. <laughs> I, I love cannot, it. I cannot actually take credit for. Uh, she was a rescue, um, oh, and there's wow. a um, a vet tech university, Argosy University, that that had her. And one of one of my good friends was going to school there, um, and it's the third year students that get to name like the seniors basically oh, get to name yeah. the rescue pets. Um, she was a first year at the time, I believe, um, and she grabbed Helga and said, "Oh my God, you need to adopt this cat. Um, the name's perfect." Blah blah blah. Yeah. Uh, and actually, it it worked out so great because she. Um, she had what was wrong. She was malnourished enough when she was rescued that she had brain damage. And it was the type of thing where for most cats, she shouldn't have survived. Yeah. And for most that survived, she should have had way more problems with like motor function and things. And yeah. she was beating the odds. Um, she still had trouble with like, she didn't learn how to jump on the counter till she was over a year. Mm. So she was a little slow in some aspects like that, but just a yeah. little, a little genius actually. Like she's amazing. Oh. Um, she is 15 now. Wow, because uh, my my husband and I celebrated our our fifteenth wedding anniversary this year, and we got her the week we got married. So she's our Aww. baby. She is Aww. truly our fur baby. Yeah, um, and I love her to death. She's a she's a tuxedo cat, but a gray, like a deep gray that almost has like that. If the sun catches the light, you can see like the deep brown at the roots. It's like a really pretty, almost like a Russian blue kind of color. Like I just oh, oh gorgeous, yeah. And she yes, she, with gold eyes. She's my baby. I would show her off if she was here. She, she's, she's, she's often she's in her not ready for world, her but, close up. Today. Yes, you know. <laughs> but this is usually my my backdrop when I'm just thrown on a TikTok or something too. And I have many right. where she'll be sleeping there. Right. I forget what it was for, but I had one in particular where I said something and literally she stretched it like this is the exact <laughs> perfect moment. So I had to like add a little arrow to the upload to be like, oh, there's a kitty cameo. Like it was just so cute. I'm like, you little stinker. But yeah, so I have my my one fur baby. We, once upon a time, we, we did have two, but he did not live as long. He passed away a few years ago, but and I would get another kitten in a heartbeat, but Helga would never forgive me. Uh, so that that will wait. Uh, yeah. That will wait until hopefully years from now when she does eventually pass. But but yes, I have my one beautiful fur baby. I do also love dogs. I have lots of friends um, that have dogs that are just like my best buddies, but I'm allergic. So like I will love on them like crazy. And then I can't have them in my house when I'm going to sleep or my asthmatics up. But I do still. I love am too. like the complete opposite. opposite. Um, I am super allergic to cats. Yeah, they'll give me a horrible asthma attack. Something about the saliva, the dander yep. from Live, I'm horribly allergic to. I'm actually also allergic to quite a number of dog braids too. If they are major shedders and stuff, not quite yeah. as bad as cats, but like I can only have like the quote unquote hypoallergenic breeds, and even then, I still often have to take like daily antihistamine kind of sure. deals to keep things okay. <laughs> but uh, it it's very sad. But I I love many many kinds of animals. But um yeah, they're uh, you know I love cats self sufficiency um because dogs are so much more complicated they're much more needy um and like when if you've got to go away you can't just leave oh, them yeah. on their own for a weekend and you know stuff like that but they're also wonderfully like derpy and just like the the blind like just adoration and like I mean, every time I could be, I could be taking the trash can to the end of my driveway <laughs> and yeah. come back and I get a, a welcome, like I have returned from the great war. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so much, it's like the 2.3 minutes, you know? <laughs> Whereas I get back and Helga looks at us like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> unless it's been if it's been like a long weekend then she gets very needy and she'll then she'll sleep like right by my head that night or something Aww. or if it's really long or two weekends in a row or something then she gets mad and she's oh, like yeah. i'm gonna shun you for a day right. you me. <laughs> lots of little personality very sassy cat i love it 
Well, okay. I have to ask, because I usually ask most of my guests here, um, as they know, I'm a big sci-fi nerd. And so I always have to ask, Star Trek or Star Wars and why? And I do love them both. And I feel like there doesn't have to be a war between the two sides, <laughs> right? right? Exactly. Because, <laughs> uh, but for me, it's Star Trek all the way. Um, and it's because that's that's what I grew up on. Like, I have some very powerful early memories of like, um, in particular, I remember when after Next Generation was first airing and I'm watching it as a young, young kid. Yeah. It was after I'd watched that that I was first going back and watching the original Trek movies. Um, and Star Trek Six is one of my favorites, um, Undiscovered Country, which is mm. just fantastic. Um, and it was so beautiful. There's this moment at the very end where Kirk's signing off and he says, you know, where no man, and he pauses where no one has gone before, passing the torch into the corrected language that yeah. Next Generation used. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I had to have been, I don't know, 10. You know, I don't even know how old I am, right, when I'm watching this, um, probably younger, I forget when. But like knowing that, knowing it was a passing of the torch and like really understanding what that meant at the time. I remember it like it was one of those times I got kind of like weepy eyed really yeah. early. Um, and just the effect that that series um, had for me. Mm -hmm. And see, my husband actually did not really grow up on it. And oh. so within the, the last few years, it was really fun. Um, I started, we started going through all of it. All of it meaning next gen um, Deep Space Nine and Voyager. Um, I have seen most, but not all of original Trek, but I do want to go yeah. back and watch all of it. I've seen all the movies millions of yeah, times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know I'm, I'm a heathen that I haven't actually seen all of the original <laughs> series. Um, and I never saw all of Enterprise that had Scott Bakula in it. I will admit yeah. that too. And I haven't seen any of the new series. Um, yeah, I haven't either. None of the new stuff. Uh, but it was a lot of fun going through because um, Next Generation, um, Deep Space Nine and Voyager are all seven seasons. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot to work with there. Um, and it was just a lot of fun um, going back and going through it all. So I think it it mostly was first exposure kind of stuff. Um, just yeah. always made me love that more. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I, I have a weird story with Star Wars. I mean, I still love it, right? But um, I didn't really see it much. Oh, um, and like I must have seen like bits and pieces here and there as a kid. But I didn't actually watch beginning to end until the remasters came out in oh, that was wow. the 90s, right? Yeah, because it was before episode one and all that. When they yeah. did the remasters and they re-released it. <clears throat> yeah. When they re-released it in theaters, I went and I don't know how this happened, but I did not know that Luke, I am your father. I didn't somehow it had bypassed me entirely. Oh wow. and I didn't know. So I'm literally sitting in the theater in the theater getting to experience what my older siblings experienced in the 70s and 80s watching the originals mm -hmm. and I like turn to my mom and I'm like oh my god and she's like how do you not know that everybody knows that like it's already a well-known fact somehow it had bypassed me as a kid where I just missed it on tv didn't hear people talk about it you know this is early internet days too so yeah. you're not getting it bombarded by stuff and that, like, that's a claim to fame to me that I got to experience it as that's if it was, so you know that great. first time yeah. And so I do have a great love for it as well. Um, but if I have to choose, it's always, it's going to be Trek mm -hmm. all the way. Yeah, I uh, I love both of them as well, although I lean more towards Star Trek. Um, I grew up on Next Generation. Um, and, you know, Captain Jean-Luc Picard will always mm -hmm. be my favorite captain, I suspect. But, um, but yeah, no, but I also grew up on Star Wars. Like we had the VHS tapes and stuff and i want to say return of the jedi came out when i in the 80s when i was i don't know how old i didn't see it in the theater i know we, it was 83 and i only know it was 83 because i was recently recently watching something that said return of the jedi was 83. okay so pretty, yeah pretty, so pretty, i would have been pretty. still pretty young but um you know i saw it on vhs and everything and so actually i still prefer the original theatrical cuts versus oh the, yes yes like cgi mm -hmm. um Restaurant. Oh, she has passed by for oh, a cameo. Used to be. She's uh -huh. like, oh. what? Oh. Right, she doesn't look 15 at all, does she? She no. doesn't make out to be. She's oh. very beautiful. Uh huh. <laughs> I did not ask for this. Well, but yes, that's uh, Elgin. <laughs> we are near the end of our time. Sorry, I've got like an eyelash or something in my eye that's bugging me. Oh, here. that's the worst. <laughs> Um, but I always like to sort of end by uh, asking my guests to give our viewers a little bit of a sneak peek or preview into what they can expect 
uh, in the next uh, few months or upcoming year from you? Uh, I actually am hitting like my busiest time Ooh. ever, I think. Um, and again, it's not that I write this quickly. My queue yeah. just ended up filling up to this point. So I actually <laughs> had, um, I had a release last month, um, which was the real kickoff for it, which was um, the fourth and final book in my uh, Moonlight Prophecy series, which is a shifter vampire magic series. Um, that's all on KU um, and is now complete with the four books. Then of course, last court is on this month. Yeah. Uh, next month in October, uh, and this this is a collab that's already been announced and actually mm. has already started having some releases. Uh, it's the Possessive Love collaboration. So oh. it's focus. Mm. That's my Mind's in October release, Son of the Archdemon on October 15th. Um, so the idea was we were having, you know, a human and demon kind of MC. Yeah. Um, otherwise, there, it's not a connected universe or anything. It's all just yeah. kind of, we all just did our own thing, but with a demonic focus, basically. I love it. Yeah. And I, I just, you know, I have it with my beta readers and editors now, and I, I really love how it turned out. I actually, um, that one is up for pre-order right now for $3.99. Um, after the first week, I'm going to be upping it to $4.99 because I planned it to be 65,000 words and it became over 80. So oh, wow. I'm going to have to up that. But I, so I'm doing a special promotion to leave it yeah, at the price okay. for that first week. So now pre-order it or get it the first week and you'll, you'll save a dollar. Um, then in November is the fifth and final book in my, uh, excuse me, in my Gemstone Kingdoms, Tales from the Gemstone mm. Kingdoms. Um, so that's where the Prince and the Ice King comes from. Um, it's a five book series. They can all be read standalone. They follow different, all of them follow a different couple. Um, yeah. There is certain things that kind of like tie together and have through ways, but you could read them out of order. You could read them separately, especially with this fifth one, because it's set 30 years later, but then you get to like have mm. sneak peeks is what has happened to these other couples. Mm -hmm. So you could read them however you want. It's just if you read them in a weird order, you'll go, oh, I want to read how that couple got together and it'll make you want to go back. Um, but I'm excited for the one in November. It's the dragon and the Emerald King. So I'm actually my first time doing a dragon character. So he obviously he shifts into multiple different forms. Nice. Uh, he's a platinum dragon too. And I had so much fun uh, writing this character. He's definitely, definitely up there with some of my favorite characters because he's a bit sneaky and fun. And that series is all kind of inspired by various uh, fairy tale ideas. So actually with the dragon one is where I do the careful what you wish for kind of trope. Yeah. Um, as the, the plot revolves around uh, my dragon character packs giving three scales to the human MC. Oh, cool. So it's three wishes kind of thing. Um, December will be these secret, not yet announced uh, Christmas <laughs> collaboration. Um, so there's, I'll, I'll have a December release as well. Wow. Um, and then I actually have something at least of right now so, some dates might change but i have a january and february release planned as well that are also part of not yet announced collaborations oh, goodness um, and then i have a much later collaboration also yeah. not announced so i, I i'm gonna stop i promise i need to, <laughs> i need to pull back i need to pull back because uh one of the bigger collaborations i'm in next year um i'm running it um and so that's yeah. a very different kind of process when you're the one kind of in charge um and I think that one will probably be my burnout moment because it's going to be a lot to herd the cats of so many authors. Um, but right. I, I love it. I'm very excited for it. I have so much in store for people um, the end of this year into next year and uh, lots of other stuff. But I might then take a bit of a breather to slow down because <laughs> um, I have lots of other things that I'd like to work on, including mm -hmm. um, a demonic MMM romance Ooh. that my um, Facebook group, Amanda Mavis and Books, has been helping me like kind of plot out ideas for. Ooh. I'm taking polls and letting them decide, oh, this one's going to okay. be darker. It's going to go like this. Um, and I don't know yet when I like that one's going to happen, but it's one that if you join my Facebook group, you can potentially help, you know, oh, vote and steer yeah. the direction of that story. So lots, lots, lots coming up from me. Um, but I'm cool. super excited, obviously for last courtesan. I'm, I'm, yeah. I know a lot of people have been waiting on it. Oh, and I should mention too, when I have those physical copies with me, I will be putting it on my Etsy store for signed copies for those people who can't see me in person at conventions. That will be an option eventually. Right. Yeah. And uh, for anyone attending uh, GRL in October, uh, Amanda is going to be there. Uh, so will I. And we are going to be part of a fabulous tentacle themed panel uh with uh kl hires and uh megan maslow uh so keep an eye out for that and i'm, I'm assuming you'll have copies of the last quarter i will i will I, I did get quite a few pre-orders for it so i made sure i upped 
how many I'm bringing. So I'll have a quite a few extras, but when I'm out, I'm out. Um, so if you didn't pre-order it, but are attending GRL, you know, there, there will be limited copies. So make sure you, you know, check the times for signings right. um, and lounge lounges and things like that. If you'd like to snag one, but I will have at the very least, I have kind of a new card I've been doing. It's like a little print, yeah. little postcard yeah. print of it, but then it still has my information on the back. So Love I have regular it. business cards too, of course, but I figured this way you get a nice little pretty picture. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, well, Amanda, thank you so much for joining me today and uh, make sure readers that you go ahead and check out the last courtesan of Olympus. This looks amazing. Uh, I can't wait to check it out myself until next time. Thank you so much. Thank Bye-bye. You.